In this section, we'll be looking at electric fields. So firstly, a bit of a history about the electricity. Uh, in 1600, William Gilbert coined the term electricus, which was Latin for amber, and the Greek word electron, which also meant amber. And he did this because he discovered that he could rub an amber rod against a piece of wool and it would repel or attract other objects. So they didn't know that this was generating static electricity at the time, but he realized that it could repel or attract objects and he, he coined it the term electricus based on that amber. In the 17th century, Otto von Gurich observed attraction and repulsion of charges. And then Benjamin Franklin came along and he introduced the terms of positive and negative to describe the nature of charges. A positive charge is produced by the shortage of normal amount of electrons and a negative charge is produced by an excess number of electrons. The unit of charge is the Coulomb, named after Charles Augustine de Coulomb. And a Coulomb by definition is the charge transported by a constant current of one amp for one second. There's actually a huge amount of current. So in the real world, we don't see coulombs very often. Often we use much, much smaller values. So if a coulomb is one amp per second, the typical charge that we find on a body in the real world is in the order of micro coulombs. So 10 to the minus six coulombs. To give you some perspective, the charge of one single electron is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The charge on a proton is positive and it's equal in magnitude to the charge of the electron. So on the formula sheets, you'll be given the electron charge, but not the proton charge. So in a question that asks you to calculate something to do with a proton, it's just important that you know that the charge is exactly the same as the electron, just in the opposite direction. Coulomb's law. Firstly, any two stationary charges experience a mutual force along the line joining the charges. So that's really important, mutual force. This ties in with uh, both Coulomb's law and a bit of superposition, but basically it's very similar to Newton's third law. If one charge has uh, a force acting on it, then the other charge must also have an equal and opposite force acting on it. So if the charges are the same, then they're repelling, so the charges are pushing away. And if the charges are different, so a positive and a negative, then they're attractive forces, so that they will be pulled towards each other. As I mentioned before, a proton has the same but opposite charge, and often we use the symbol E. So if you ever see this little E, it represents the charge of an electron, or it's talking about an electron. So this is Coulomb's law. At first, it looks quite complicated. Um, in words, Coulomb's law states that the magnitude of the electrostatic force between two charges is directly proportional to the magnitude of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the charges. If we look at all of the pieces, the Qs are just charges. So we use the symbol Q to represent a charge, and this would be in units of Coulombs. So this is the charge of one object, this is the charge of the other object, and this is the distance between them. And just like with satellites, it uses radius because of the electric field being circular, which we'll cover a bit later. This thing here, this one over four pi epsilon or epsilon naught is just Coulomb's law constant. So a bit like the big G in satellites and gravitation, this is basically just one big constant and this is given to you on the formula sheet as well. So really you just need to remember the one over four pi epsilon naught is Coulomb's constant and it's Q1, Q2 over R squared. That is the force between two charges. An example that you can see here, due to Newton's third law, is that the forces are directly opposite and equal in magnitude. So if I've got two equal charges here, a three micro coulomb and a three micro coulomb, they will feel both an 8.1 times 10 to the negative two Newton force, but they're acting in opposite directions. So that is also part of Coulomb's law, the equal and opposite, as well as the formula here. It's really important that you understand what the proportionality is of this formula. So if we look at the equation, Coulomb's law here, we can see that force is directly proportional to Q1 and Q2. And it's important here that you'd be able to identify what is actually constant. So if we're talking about force proportional to Q1, Q2, this is always a constant, so therefore that's maintaining a constant radius. So this is saying if you want the radius to be the same and you increase the charge on one of them, the force must increase to balance out. Conversely, force is indirectly proportional to one over the distance squared. 
So if I'm talking about the proportionality between this and this, then the charges must also be constant. So that's your proportionalities. Okay, so an example question for this is if I had a force of 50 newtons from two charges and I replace one charge with something triple the size, what happens to the force? This is the kind of question that you might be asked in terms of the proportionality. It's important that you understand how to describe this. In this case, it also triples in size to 150 newtons because force and charge are directly proportional. What about now if I replace a charge with one triple the size, but I also double the distance between them? So I've tripled the cube, but I've also doubled the radius. The force would be tripled because it's directly proportional, but it's also reduced by a quarter. Because of the radius squared factor, the radius becomes four times smaller, so it's tripled and one fourth the size. So I worked that out and I had 50 newtons, I end up with three quarters of 50 newtons and 37.5 newtons remaining. The principle of superposition. This is another important feature that you would need to be able to explain. Given that Coulomb's law uh, tells us the force between two charges, it only tells us the force between two charges, however. So we need something else to be able to calculate. Well, if we had three charges or four charges and we want to know the force of all of them acting on one object, you can't use Coulomb's law for that. So if we want to do this for two or more objects, we need to calculate them separately and then add them all vectorially. So it's a bit like adding momentum or adding uh, forces. We just do it using vector diagrams. So this is the concept of superposition and they often use this little phrase here if you were asked to explain it. It would be that when more than two point charges are present, the force on any one is the vector sum of the electric forces acting due to each of the other point charges present. So it's basically saying you combine all of your forces vectorially, you'll get a resultant vector. So it's just vector addition again, but that's how you calculate for more than two. This is something that as per the SACE outline, you need to be able to explain what is meant by the principle of superposition. So electric fields in general. Firstly, we'll talk about some types of forces. Back in the day before we sort of understood how these things worked, there were two main questions that people were asking. Firstly, how does one body know about the presence of the other in order to exert a force on it? If they're not touching each other, how can they transmit this information? How does it know? And then the other one was, if the distance between them was increased, how was this information communicated from one body to the other in order that they knew to exert a smaller force? So it seems kind of obvious now, but if you didn't understand electric fields and electric charges as we do today, think about how would you explain that, that you've got two objects that are not touching, but if I move them apart, the force decreases. How have they communicated that, so to speak? There needs to be some transfer of information. The two aspects that we need to consider here is you've got a contact force, and this is where things are actually in contact with each other. So most of the stuff we've talked about in terms of momentum, um, general forces of pushing an object, these are all contact forces. The other one we've got is non-contact forces. So this is where the object is separated or the bodies are separated by some distance, yet they can still apply a force on each other. So for example, gravitation is an example of a non-contact force. And these are examples of what we call an action at a distance. In the 19th century, Michael Faraday developed the concept of the electric field to explain this interaction. He came up with this theory of field lines. So he said that the electric field from an isolated positive charge would be shooting outwards, and the electric field from an isolated negative charge would be shooting inwards. Each charge somehow modifies the properties of the space around it, which creates an electric field in that space. Each body comes into contact with the field of the other, and the information is therefore transmitted from one to the other via their fields. So even though we're saying this is a, an action at a distance sort of situation, it's actually that the fields are in contact with each other, and the particles are in contact with the field. So we would say that this is in terms of charges interacting with the field, and not as in the action at a distance point of view of the two charges interacting directly with each other. 
pictorially, so how do we draw electric fields? The lines of the force are drawn so that the number of lines of force per unit cross-sectional area is directly proportional to the field strength. So a bit like when we talked about gravitational field lines, it's exactly the same concept. The more lines we have, the stronger the force. And it's also important to know that the field lines are drawn perpendicular to the object. So we'll cover that in a little bit. But the lines leaving the object are always perpendicular to its surface. If we have a lot of lines close together, that implies a strong field strength. And if we've got a section where there's a lot of lines further apart, we have a weak field strength. And from the diagrams, it's easy to see that the relationship between the electric field strength and the distance should not be linear. Because here, in a small space, I've got a lot of lines. But if I then go all the way out here, the same kind of space only has one, maybe two lines. So you can see that as the radius increases, the force, the electric field force or strength, is going to drop off quite rapidly, just like with gravitation. Electric field lines are drawn outward if we have a positive charge, as shown here, and they're drawn radially inward for a negative charge. So we think of the negative being attractive and the positive being repulsive. The current or the lines always go positive to negative. The direction of the lines in the field is the direction of the force on a small positive test charge. So a bit like with gravitation, we talked about a test mass. Now we're talking about a test charge. This is just an object that has a very, very small charge, so much so that it's not going to affect the force or the pull on the main source. So if we put this little positive test charge at any point in these lines, the direction of the line is the direction that that charge will be sent. So I can see that if I put a positive charge on this line, it's going to be pushed away. Positive charge on this line, it's going to be pulled inwards towards the negative, And this one is also pushed away. The lines of force will never cross each other. And in a uniform field, they're evenly spaced to signify that the field strength is constant, which it always is. So we'll cover this in a little bit more detail next lesson in terms of like parallel fields and parallel charge plates and things like that. But for now, um, we'll cover the main points here. And that is the electric field between two finite parallel conducting plates with equal and opposite charges would look like this. So we're obviously going from positive to negative, they're equally spaced, and at the ends we're going to have some sort of a loop where it's sort of coming out and back in. And this would in theory keep going out for a long, long time until it dissipated. A positive test charge will experience the same force no matter where it's placed within this field. So if it's here, 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 it doesn't matter. It's going to feel exactly the same force to push it in this direction. Near and beyond the edges of the plate, the field is non-uniform. <clears throat> so that's out here. You can see that this is no longer uniform. We'll experience different amounts of force as we drift out of here. But within the plates, we will have the same amount of force. This is commonly referred to as the end effect. The end effect is a result of the field line still having to leave and arrive on the surface of the plates at right angles. So if it's leaving at a right angle, it has to hook all the way around and come back at a right angle. So it's traveling the further distance, it's going to weaken as it travels further out. The electric field strength itself is measured as a force per unit charge experienced by the small test charge that we talked about earlier. So if it's a force per unit charge, we can write the electric field strength as F over Q, where this is the force experienced, this is the charge of the, the test mass. Obviously, I've got force and charge, newtons and charge is always coulombs. So the units of electric field strength would be newtons per coulomb. If I wanted to find the strength at point A in the field here, so I've got an isolated point charge Q, which just means I've got like a, a ridiculously small object um, that is producing a positive charge, which is why the lines are radiating outwards. And I place this small positive test charge here at point A. Coulomb's law tells me that the force on this charge is given by this, the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Q is this charge, and then little q is my test charge, and the radius squared is just the distance from it. But if I know that F over Q is the electric field strength, it's the force per unit charge, Coulomb's law gives me my force. I then plug that into my charge. And if I rearrange, you think about, I put this all over Q, these Qs will cancel out. I just get the electric field strength is big Q, so the magnitude of the charge in the middle, the actual point charge, 
divided by the 4 pi epsilon naught and the radius squared. And this is the electric field strength formula. So this is on the formula sheet, but you also need to be able to derive it. So in the SACE outlines, it says you can derive this, and it's from starting with the E equals F over Q, substituting Coulomb's law for the force on the test charge as F, and then it just cancels out. So it's relatively straightforward. Applications. So, so far you're kind of like, well, why do I need to know all this? Electric fields are useless and calculating the force on an object is kind of pointless because I don't really care what atoms and electrons are doing. The shark shield is actually an application of this that they are using. So you can see this little picture up here. It contains two electrodes and a long cord that trails behind the user, kind of like a little stingray tail. It can be worn around the ankle. You can fit it to a surfboard. There's a whole range of ways you can do it. But basically it emits an electric field that surrounds the user. So it creates your own portable electric field. Another application is the Faraday cage. This is particularly cool in terms of both earthing yourself from outside electricity and also if you want to create a, a bit of a, a paranoid room for yourself where no one can contact you and you're completely shut off from outside communication. So today we are going to learn about electrostatic shielding and Faraday cages and why it's not such a bad thing if you're in a lightning storm as long as you're inside a car. And uh, I don't want to do that with me, so we're going to do it with Benjamin. Um, here we have Benjamin Franklin wearing a uh, nice little uh, Hawaiian hula skirt made of tinsel. And he is about to be in a thunderstorm. Um, we are going to make our thunderstorm with our Van de Graaff generator. You can think of the belt in the Van de Graaff generator going around like this as analogous to the air circulation underneath the thunderhead as the thunderhead builds up. And then you can think of this up here as the analog of the cloud. So as soon as I unground this, it's going to start charging up. And you see Mr. Franklin there getting a little bit uncomfortable. You see his hula skirt streaming out behind him as he is in right now in quite a large electric field. Um, and uh, as you can get a sense there, he's not so happy at this point. Maybe I'll turn it up even higher. There you see, well, I've got a lightning bolt going to my grounding rod. And as you can look at what's happening to Benjamin as the lightning bolt hits the grounding rod. There you go. Benjamin is not happy. So now what we're going to do is we are going to have the same thunderstorm, the same electric field, but we are going to put Benjamin in a Faraday cage. So. To put him in the cage, I'm going to start by turning this off, and we'll ground him. And here's my Faraday cage right here. I'm going to put Benjamin in the cage. Here we go. Okay. Benjamin's going to be in the same spot that he was before, same tinsel skirt that he has had before, but this time he is in a cage, like, for example, you're in a thunderstorm, but you are safely in a car. So let's see whether it is indeed safe. And here we go. Let's turn on the thunder, or the lightning, rather. Let's turn on the lightning. Now, if you look, you can see that there's lightning hitting the cage. There is that lightning bolt going from the Van de Graaff right to the cage here. And you can see that the cage has a very considerable electric field on it by looking at the tinsel over here on the far side, which is streaming out behind it just like the tinsel on Benjamin was before. But now look inside at Benjamin in there, and I have to be careful not to touch the cage. But now look inside at Benjamin in there, and his tinsel is completely motionless. Benjamin is completely comfortable in there, calm, at rest, while the lightning storm rages around him, literally around him, and that just got me. Um, if I touch that, I get shocked, okay? That's what, that's what, that I just got shocked, but Benjamin is completely safe. This is the phenomenon of electrostatic shielding, and this kind of a cage is often called a Faraday cage. And we'll now turn the lightning off. So some questions from the workbook. If you look at page 128, question one to 14, that is quite a few questions and there are several parts to it. 
but I've broken them down for you. So have a go at at least one of each of these kind of questions. Some of them are very similar. So in this one here, you could just talk about doing one question with multiple charges. And if you feel comfortable with it, this is a superposition style, then you don't need to do the others. Electric field strength, sketching some lines, maybe just do the first one and draw the field lines. This is basically the same sort of question as the one above, but it's using the hydrogen atom and the electron. And there is a link in part B and C to showing how is this the same as uniform circular motion and calculating an orbital speed based on what we've done before. So here's some questions to work on. Um, enjoy. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. 